So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our program. My name is Anne Nichol. I'm executive director of the United Nations Association of New York. And we're very honored today to have with us the First Lady of Iceland, Eliza Reid. Eliza Reid is going to discuss with us her new book, Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Woman and How They're Changing the World. Sprakar is an Icelandic word that means extraordinary woman, and it is indeed extraordinary how gender equality has become such a core value in Iceland. In addition to being the first lady of Iceland, Eliza Reid is a writer. She, she co-founded the annual Iceland Writers Retreat. She has been in the forefront of promoting gender equality and highlighting the country's rich literary heritage. To discuss the book and exploring the insights, its insights with the First Lady will be Hannah Berna Christian's daughter, Senior Advisor on Women's Leadership at UN Women. Ms. Christian Dotter, in her own right, has broken glass ceilings in, in the politics of Iceland. Before getting elected to parliament, she was the mayor of the city of Reykjavik. And to introduce the first lady, Lady Eliza Reid, and start us off this afternoon, we're very pleased to have with us the permanent representative of Iceland to the United Nations, Ambassador Valtisson who has represented Iceland at the UN since September, 2019. So I'm sure we're all eager to get the, to the program. Uh, so without further ado, um, I will give the floor to you, Mr. Ambassador. Well, thank you, Madam Executive Director, First Lady Eliza Reid, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really honored to be here with you today to celebrate this year's International Women's Day and the ongoing 66th session of the uh, UN Commission on the Status of Women with a book talk about the uh, secrets of Spraka, Iceland's extraordinary women and how they are changing the world by, by Ms. Uh, Eliza Reid. As the uh, ambassador of Iceland to the United Nations, but also a father of four children, including three teenage girls, I, I take great pleasure and pride in representing a country that has ranked number one in the world on the Gender Equality Index for now 12 consecutive years. But I'm also very mindful of how much work it took by many brave women and pioneers and how hard-won gains can be reversed as we witness in many corners of the world. And I'm equally mindful of the work that, will, uh, that still needs to be done, uh, including in Iceland, or as the author of our book today puts it, the country where gender equality is within reach, tantalizingly close to an unfixed finish line, yet also where frequently demoralizing and damaging challenges persist. I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed reading the uh, critically acclaimed Secrets of Spraka. It certainly is a fascinating window into what a more gender equal world could look like and why it's worth striving for, as former Secretary of State and First Lady Hillary Clinton put it. Even a Nordic thriller, as the Nordic, sorry, as the New York Times describes it. But it's also for me an intriguing outside yet inside perspective on Icelandic society. It's a personal story, full of kind-hearted humor, and uh, most importantly, of course admiration for extraordinary women, sprakar, who can be found uh, everywhere and continue to pave the way towards gender equality. And for me, as a permanent representative of Iceland to the UN and a father who is grateful for and looks forward to a paternity leave later this year, is an inspiration to keep going and pushing for that extra mile and reach uh, sustainable development goal number five, gender equality, both at home and globally. So for a fireside chat to talk about the book, I'm delighted and honored to introduce, in her own words, the entrepreneur, author, speaker, mother, feminist, and immigrant, Mrs. Eliza Reid, the First Lady of Iceland, who will be joined by a dear friend, Ms. Hanna, Mrs. Hanna Birna Kristjansdóttir, Senior Advisor at UN Women and Chair of the Reykjavik Global Forum. So thank you very much and, and, and over to you. Thank you so much, Jörundur. Thanks, Ambassador. Uh, and thanks for your kind words in the beginning. And also, let me start by thanking the uh, National United Nations Association of New York, New York City for hosting us here today. It is, of course, a real pleasure and honor for me, not just because of what I do for, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis around gender equality, uh, but also uh, Eliza is a friend and Eliza is known to all of women here in Iceland and men, as you can hear, not only for being a pioneer when it comes to gender equality, but for being one of the great women that speak out loud. 
She has courage and she never hesitates to talk about her opinion and make sure we know her opinion around this. So thanks for that, Eliza. It doesn't necessarily always come with traditional roles, but thanks for breaking the rules when it comes to that. <laughs> so without further hesitation, let's just dive in. I wanted to make sure, Eliza, and just for the audiences to know that I'm not being impolite. Uh, that we will speak on a first name basis, that's Icelandic tradition. I call Eliza by her name, not by her titles or her last name. So if that's okay, Eliza, we would move ahead like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I wanted to, because just to get the audience sort of in the atmosphere we are at. Uh, I mean, many, uh, we are having people from all over the world. I mean, some of the, the I'm talking today here are based in New York, of course. Eliza is traveling in Iceland. I'm located in Iceland as well. Eliza is doing her duties around, around the, the country with her husband. Tell us where you are and what you're doing, Eliza. Yes, I will do that. And but but also I will do my little thank you and, and hello before we really get into the discussion, if I may, um, to thank Anne for the very kind invitation to speak with you today, to thank um, the ambassador Jurundur for his very kind remarks, um, not least because one of the things I, I maybe don't address enough in my book, but is very important is the role that men have to play in this gender equality. Um, battle because I think one of the huge uh, benefits and advantages for Iceland is that by and large the men of the country here are on board with this idea and realize that trying to work towards greater gender equality is something that is going to benefit everybody of all genders and so thank you for that uh, reminder and, and, and for your in involvement. And Hannah Bitten, of course, I'm so grateful that, that you <laughs> agreed to take part in this. Um, I, I um, for, for those of you uh, watching and listening now, um, I, I, I got a lot of help from Hannah when I was getting some background information on this book. We were both in Seattle a couple of years ago, and, and Hannah delivered a wonderful speech on gender equality in Iceland. And I, I've asked for, for her statistics to steal from her on, on many occasions. But even before that, before I actually had met her, um, I heard her speak once years ago when she was serving as mayor of Reykjavik at an event. And I, I remember it very much because I was so impressed. Um, I, I didn't understand as much Icelandic then. So I don't know about the, I don't know what I remember very much about the content, but the delivery was excellent because I remember what an involved and impassioned speaker you were. And, and I think that, that that is so important. To answer your question though, um, I am, yes, here in, in Iceland, you can see the sun is shining on my face, which it isn't always. I'm in a very small community, probably about as far as you can get from Reykjavik in the Northeast called Thorshöp or, or Thor's Harbor. Uh, my husband, Gluni and I are on an official visit to this community here today. And tomorrow we will be in the town of Vatnafjörður, which uh, for those of you who have read my book, I, I feature in, in my book in, in the chapter on immigration. And uh, again, that is something that the, the, the president of the country and, and usually his or her spouse, if there's there, goes to try to go to several official visits to districts of the country uh, several times per year to uh, get to know the people of the community. We visit uh, workplaces, schools, healthcare centers. We've been going stop to stop to stop all day um, and eating delicious food that the women's associations have been making for us. So um, when this meeting is finished, then we are driving to the next town, which is called Bakafjörður, where there will be more meetings and, and dinners. So um, it's a great privilege to have this opportunity to, to travel and see the country. And especially this is the first, um, we, did, we did have one, we managed one official visit closer to Reykjavik during the pandemic, but otherwise we really haven't been able to, to do these visits. So it's, it's really nice to be getting back into that. Great, thank you so much, Eliza. And I wanted to draw a bit on that because in your book, The Secrets of the Sprachar, you do one thing that I think is so important when it comes to gender equality. You draw our attention to ordinary people doing ordinary things, but doing it for the greater cause and the good of gender equality. So I'm assuming even in this small town in Iceland, you have loads of sprachars mm -hmm. and lots of also what you mentioned and we can hear so clearly from our ambassador. And I think also, as you mentioned, is often forgotten. It's not only about courageous women doing things differently, but also around courageous men having the courage to do things differently. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to connect that. I mean, in your book, you talk a lot about these sprachars and how they have as strong women fighting mm -hmm. for loads of different things. 
dedicated their mission, if you like, to making sure that women and girls have the same opportunity. And you are placing that at a similar level as the one that officially break the glass ceiling. Do you know what I mean? Those that we know and see. You're pointing yeah. to the sort of joy of it being a com sort of bigger project and then just naming few women that make it, if you like. Could you reflect yeah. on that? Yes, I think that was very important to me in this book that I wanted to capture a diversity of voices. And I wanted them, as you say, to be kind of everyday voices because I hope that it also inspired us as people or for the readers to realize that we all have something outstanding within us and that we can all be role models and make a difference. We don't need to be the first person to do something. We don't need to be the best person to do something or a spokesperson for something else. We really just have to uh, live live authentic lives and, and try to be a positive influence on, on the people around us and try to help elevate other people uh, if, if we're in such a privileged situation that, that we're able to do that. And, and so you're right. I mean, in Iceland, when people talk about gender equality, we often and, and understandably mention, for example, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir, the, the world's first female president, and we mention our, our female prime ministers or, or the woman who, who climbed Mount Everest. And, and of course, these are, are wonderful people and, and admiral situations, but I thought, you know, not all of us would ever be president or, or be prime minister or climb Mount Everest or, or be the chief of police. Um, but we can all have an influence. So I really try to search for people who, who aren't necessarily consciously doing something to to push towards gender equality but just by the fact that either they are you know they've become a a, a fishing boat captain and only woman graduating in their class um you, you know not to prove something or do something else but but that's what she wanted to do with her life and and that to me is a good reflection of equality um or or somebody else who you know breastfed her baby in parliament because of course you're going to feed your baby if she's hungry. So I, I think, I, I hope that by telling these different stories, it, it provides everybody else with some inspiration that we can all make a difference in our lives, that that working towards gender equality isn't, you know, policies and things are important, but it isn't the be all and end all, that we can all have, a, have an indi individual influence. Exactly. And I think also, Eliza, as you point so well out in your in your book, the fact that I mean, because we are often asked, what is the magic behind this being uh, the, the wonderful place of gender equality Iceland is? Uh, I mean, I think part of the magic is it it being everybody's business, not just the business of few, but the business of all, and we all take pride in it. But I wanted to take you take us back. I mean, we know you're in Thorsa, but I want to take you back to the states. Yep. Last week you, you were in the States and we could see, at least in the Icelandic media, and also I was in, in the States myself, I saw it was in the media there as well, that you had a conversation with President Biden and the US First Lady Jill Biden, and I could see that the headlines at least were around gender equality, and this mm -hmm. is of course why I assume you actually in your busy schedule sat, sat down and decided I'm actually going to write about it because I need to make sure everybody knows about it. What did you tell them about sort of what was your advice or what was your sort of what can Iceland give to others when it comes to gender equality? Well, I hope that what Iceland can do is sort of serve as an influence. And I'm going to I would be the last person to say, uh, you know, we do it this way in Iceland and therefore that's the way you need to do it. You know, this is something that. Uh, certainly, I didn't write this book to tell other countries what they should be doing specifically, but more hoping to provide some form of, of inspiration for people on an individual basis. But as you know, we're, you know, we're a small country with 370,000 people um, in, in some senses that does make it easier to implement change and to judge the, the success of such changes. Um, it also means that we can't be the best in everything for things, but we can really develop certain niche areas. And I think uh, if we don't already have a reputation as a leader in gender equality, we deserve to have that reputation. And um, uh, when I, yes, uh, when the first lady kindly invited me to the White House last week to have a discussion with her, and uh, it was right before an event at the White House on Women's History Month in the US. And, and so that was a, an excellent moment to be able to, um, you know, just talk a little bit about, about what we are doing, about what's going on in the US and the priorities there for, for, for example, for equal pay legislation and, uh, and, and have the opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, just the benefit that it has for us. Um, a few days later, 
I also met with representative of the Women's Caucus uh, in the Capitol building and spoke to them as well about, you know, just the importance of gender equality, the importance of seeing women in roles such as in politics. Um, it was great to see all of all of the um, not only the congresswomen who were there, but their staffers and assistants, the the younger women who were coming into politics. And I I tried to encourage them and you know say and as you know yourself with a career in politics, I, I'm speaking from this qu quite. I don't know, lazy position, you know, I never ran for office. So I never had to deal with all of the um, uh, dirt, <laughs> I'm trying to say, about, think of a polite word, the people who who have, have the courage and, 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 and take the time to actually run for office. But if we don't have people who do that, nothing is going to change. So I have this tremendous admiration um, for for women, especially who, who go into politics, who put themselves in the firing line, because it really helps field for generation of, of people as well. Um, uh, you know, that was all just very important dialogue. And, and we we're just trying to talk about that overall, that it's it's not, of course, just in um, not just, of course, in areas of, of politics, but in other visible areas, just where we need more women role models in all kinds of fields. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering because you say that you come from it from a different perspective. I mean, still you, I mean, you lead a fairly busy life from the outset. I mean, uh, you of course are the first lady of Iceland, but you have been of course a journalist. You host this writer's retreat in Iceland every year where you greet loads of people to come to Iceland and sort of talk about literature. You are really, really active when it comes to all kinds of missions uh, for the greater good, both internationally and in Iceland. I mean, what I'm just wondering, because we have so, only so many hours in the in the in the in the mm -hmm. day, if you like, mm -hmm. and some of us just talk about gender equality. We mm -hmm. do that every day. But why did you feel the urge? I mean, I know you're a former journalist. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. from a perspective of that. Why? Why did you feel the need to sit down and do mm -hmm. more than just talks? It just, it's just something that's always been important to me, you know, and, and ever since I was growing up, you know, I, I used to wonder, I mean, I, I remember asking my, 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 um, someone in my family, you know, and this is growing up in Canada. I, what a shame. Why did girls have to change their name when they get married? I, that doesn't seem fair to me. I really like my name and, and not thinking of it as a gender equality, but why, why is it like this and not like this for my brothers? Um, and, and asking, you know, it's just something that always was, was in my mind. Um, and then when I uh, had this sort of unexpected opportunity to serve as first lady, at first I didn't feel like I ought to talk about something like gender equality because I thought, well, I only have this platform because my husband has achieved something and therefore it's too much of an irony to talk about gender issues. But then of course you have to, you know, I have this opportunity, which is just this incredible, unique thing and, and I should make the most of it. So um, it, it, not only that, but I think there are still expectations or, or assumptions maybe surrounding the wives, as it were, of, of certain people and how, you know, one one's identity in the public eye becomes forged purely in relation to one other individual, which is a very, you know, strange feeling because I'm very proud to be Glennie's wife, but I don't think it's my Um, that I was my my own person, and uh, I can you hear me all right? You know what you you blipped out a little bit. Oh, did I? I'm so sorry. Okay, hopefully I just um uh, I'm not sure how back. I'm sorry because I'm in a guest house in the middle <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. But just um Hannah, wave your hands again if I start yes. freezing. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um. So I I'm I'm not sure where I was there really, but um. Uh, I was talking about, you know, that I'm serving in this in this role of first lady, and I want to kind of confound expectations about being the 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 spouse there, and how that's not really my own uh, defining characteristic, and and really just to encourage other people to to speak up, because I think that if you know, I who am I to criticize other people for not taking chances, for not talking about things, if I'm not willing to do that myself. Exactly, and and no worries about the sort of uh, connection, Eliza. I will wave if you if you uh, break up a bit. Uh, 
let us still pause a little there, little there because uh, some of the things that are important in your book, uh, amongst other things, is of course you pointing out the way ordinary women live and the way the ordinary society deals with gender equality brightly and it's part of our day-to-day -day life. But you also point out, and that was seen as a sort of progressive approach to some, when you said that you do not wish to be human accessory to your husband. <laughs> uh, I mean, the phrasing of this is super visual for, for most people and we're used to, of course, and you've told me in conversation that the concept around first lady has a sort of um, traditional views around it that you would like to shake up a bit, at least for yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you, I mean, how, how has that been met? I mean, in, a count, in, in some countries, people might say, I mean, you are the first lady, you just serve as such. But how has this been perceived in Iceland? Well, I think for me, I mean, it is an incredible honor and privilege, and I, I love doing it, and it's it, it it's so much fun. Um, but I really always want to emphasize that that is a choice. You know, I'm not in a job. There's no job as being first lady. And so while I enjoy it, and I think it's a privilege and I want to be active, I also feel like if there was another woman, say, in this position who said, you know what, you know, the president, you go and do your duty. That's your job. Uh, you have these obligations and I don't want to be involved in that. I think that that should absolutely be all right as well. I think that has to do with choice. Um, and it was interesting even today, as you say, because today I have been all day, um, this is my, this is the hour break in the schedule when I'm doing this, but I kind of liked when uh, we were having this, it was an open meeting that anybody could go to. And then as my husband said, well, uh, my, my, my wife is going to run early because she has her job to do as well. And she has to go and see, um, see to her work projects. And, and I think that that's actually an important message to give to people. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I am happy uh, to do this, and I and so I don't say anything, you, you know, to be a martyr or because I'm not complaining. I, I choose to do this, but I think it's important to remind people that that, you know, that that is a choice, and that people shouldn't expect that that therefore I I will go to certain things or behave in in certain ways, etc. So yeah, I, and I wrote a piece in the um, New York Times a couple of years ago about that, which which did well because I think that um, while maybe not that many people are married to heads of state, I think a great many people, particularly women, are often uh, married to people who, for whatever reason, are professionally better known than they are, and then they become known as that person's wife, which somehow diminishes their own identity, and I, and I think a lot of people could relate to that concept. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I mean, I should maybe have asked this differently, Eliza, because I said, how did the sort of perception of this, how was it in Iceland? We all loved it. So, I mean, I could have answered it myself, but I was still sort of making a point around that, mm -hmm. because I think that, uh, and I'm sure the, our audiences know that that's what, that was well perceived and is really sits well with the Icelandic culture of how we see the roles of women and men. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, on, uh, I mean, you came from Canada, you moved to Iceland, and I'm, try, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, Canada from the outset also is a fairly gender equal country. I mean, compared to many. I know it's number 24 and we've been number one for 12 years in a row, so it's a bit of a difference. But I'm just wondering because you talk about the stories of these women and you talk about their sort of wow moments or the moments they have when they realize something. Mm -hmm. uh, and their stories are also interesting. I mean, I if I recall on my wow moment, because I'm brought up in Iceland, I always thought that this was sort of the way to go. But my wow moment was when I had but a child for the first time and I realized because we share parental responsibility of, of mm -hmm. course we share parental leaves that when our daughters woke up in the night she was just as likely to call out for her father as he was for me mm -hmm. so I then it sat, struck me I mean I live in a society and I'm in a marriage where actually we share responsibility and it sort of calls out in the middle of the night via his name as well as my name Mm -hmm. So that was sort of my personal wow moment. I'm wondering, you came in from Canada, you come to Iceland, you you come from sort of surround, you have two brothers, I think, you have three yes. sons, so you come from a fairly sort of, it's not as if you've been lifted up constantly by, by feminists, do you know what I mean, or brought up mm -hmm. in that, maybe that, that sort mm -hmm. of um, atmosphere. How did you, did you realize in the get-go that there was something different about this in Iceland than elsewhere? I, I mean, you know, it's I, I, there's a lot of men in my life. Yeah.
sense that, you know, my mother stayed at home, my dad went off to work, but I also, I would say that they were very strong feminist role models, actually, that I never, um, that I never felt like I was being limited in any way, uh, ambition wise because of my gender. Um, and, and I think as I get older, I realize that that is privilege to have grown up in, in that environment to not have been limited by what I could do. But, um, in Iceland, I do, I, I mean, and I love that story you tell about, about your, your children calling out of the night. I remember you used it before. And, and that is the same thing that, that happens with us as well and and then they switch languages so i know which parent they're calling because one is an icelandic or an english but um i do mention one story in the book at the very beginning of the book uh, which which did just stick in my mind a lot which is from when i was working at my first job when i first moved to the country almost almost 20 years ago and um was working for a small software startup so it was very male dominated um there were only a handful of women working in the company and one woman was the chair of the board of the company. And, and one day I was walking by when they were having the meeting and she was nursing her baby um, while she was chairing the meeting because she just had a baby, obviously. And I, you know, as I recall, I think it was mostly men who were, who were on the board and nobody cared, you know, nobody, and nobody was looking away awkwardly like it was something that they they couldn't stand nobody made any kind of jokes about it it was just a completely normal and natural thing about about what you would be doing in a meeting and and i do remember that even you know i was in my 20s and i i wasn't thinking about having children myself at that time right away but i remember thinking this is good to live in a country where you know there's no stigma around breastfeeding in public or you know and 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 this idea that you can combine your your work life and your private life and and you're not seen say as being a bad mother because you're on the boards of many companies um and and yet you know and you're not seen as being you know not capable of doing seeing your professional work because you've just had a baby and and that was something that that's always stayed with me exactly I would like because I, I'm I'm thinking many of our uh, audiences might sort of uh, if we try and take the sort of uh, message of this book or these all these great stories and impact, um, and we were just sort of giving the world a menu of how you can achieve gender equality. I mean, I know it's a big question. I know you're absolutely right when you say. I mean, I cannot tell people, nations, companies, whatever, how to do it. I can only say how we did it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, there are certain criteria like women, uh, seeing women leaders, like having shared family responsibility, like what would be if, if we were to sort of provide our readers and they would say, OK, mm -hmm. what can I do? Uh, what mm -hmm. can my nation do to make sure that because Iceland isn't sort of uh, there's nothing extraordinary here. It's just a country with people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you so, don't need volcanoes or, no. <laughs> or lots of cod or something to do this. Yeah. No, no. Although that might be, a, yeah, it might be, a, yeah, it might be something. But yeah. what would be the the sort of short mm -hmm. advice? Mm -hmm. Well, for people who have read the book or or are thinking of reading the book, I, I'll give you kind of a, a sort of Easter egg or teaser as well, because um, there are eleven chapters in the book, uh, which is sort of you know, introduction, conclusion. So nine chapters in the middle, each of which focus on a different aspect of society, whether that's uh, parenthood, politics, um, arts and culture, uh, running a business, female friendships and supports. Um, there's lots of different chapters. And when I was writing the book, I tried to, I don't ever say this explicitly, but in my mind, I tried to have one kind of takeaway message or thesis with each chapter that would help as a, as a message for gender equality. So um, in politics, the idea is the importance of role models, and we're talking about it. In the chapter on the corporate life, I talk about the people who control the pocketbook are also controlling the power, meaning that unless we have more women, uh, unless we are investing more in women, and unless we have more women who actually choose what to invest in, we're also not going to see more equality. And so, uh, you know, within each chapter, I hope there's little messages. So some of those are some messages, some uh, like the one on parenthood really have to do with societal supports like parental leave and, and, and subsidized childcare. Uh, the chapter on female friendships, I think, has has to do with with taking up your space, you know, making carving out time for yourself um, to to sort of 
nurture your own well-being so that we can see all these responsibilities. Um, it, it talks about what I call the extracurriculars in the chapter on, on arts and culture and sport, meaning that it's great if we have rules and offices and we have all these panels, but if we don't read books by women, if we don't uh, see movies that are by them, if we don't watch sporting events where women are playing, then the society as a whole is also serving to silence those voices. Oh. So um, I, I hope that some of the takeaway messages in each chapter some of them are broader, some of them are sort of top down to do with legislation, but others are really a really bottom up about about, um, you know, leaving no group behind a chapter on immigration, you know, we can't say that we're achieving gender equality if it's just for one particular uh, group of women, and we're not including, you know, uh, uh, trans women, women with disabilities, immigrant women, all kinds of other groups in that. Um, following your dreams, you know, all of these are things that I that I think are are important, and hopefully they are also messages that will feel like the people who read it are being empowered as well, because. I, I think that it, the issue of gender equality isn't something, you know, it's like the, the climate change crisis. And, you know, I can lie awake at night and think, okay, I'm recycling and I'm doing this, but it's so big. What am I, what can I, how can I fix this? And with gender equality, I think we feel that way sometimes too. You know, we think, well, I'm, I'm not an elected official, so I can't control if I spend more money on parental leave. But as an individual, I can control uh, the discourse. I can control whether I speak up when I need to speak up or whether I encourage other women to speak up and stand forward. And all of that really makes a big difference. Thanks so much, Eliza. And thanks for, uh, we're, we're almost at the close of the conversation, but thanks so much in the way that exactly you summarize this. And that is what I think is the beauty of this book, because I, I absolutely agree with you that it's not sort of stating what has to be done or a preaching what must be done. It, it tells a vital story through other story, but it's actually also, in my opinion, a great manual for how it can be done. So there are these stories told, but there are also really, really super important points that can be of value in policy making, in changing of culture, and in the thinking of how can this be, this be achieved. And I also wanted to sort of uh, and on that note that I think, as you said, and, and maybe ask you in the end, because your, your book is called Secrets of the Spraka. So I would like you to reflect in the end a little bit about what is your secret, because obviously you are one of those Sprakars. Uh, and maybe also reflect a bit on what I think is so important and, and what Iceland is, I think, trying to do also, because the fight around gender equality, we, we, we even call it fight, and the sort of negative aspect in some shape or form around the fight for feminism or whatever you call it, it can be a really daunting fight. It can be like a fight that you don't see being resolved in any sort of foreseeable future, and maybe it will not. But you are, I think, and I would kindly like you to reflect on that in, in uh, because I see it, and maybe I'm just being too pushy on you, I see it as part of your secret to approach it positively, to approach mm -hmm. the issue of being doable, and to approaching the issue of not just saying, let's wait for the state, or let's wait for the organization, let's sort of, I'm not saying that you should wake up during night and say, what can I do better, but sort of, accepting that you can actually be the big change. Mm -hmm. So if you would, in the end, Eliza, just maybe reflect a little bit on that secret. Yeah, thank you. And yes, yeah, I said, I, I try to sum the secrets too at the end, and I won't do that too much. But I think, um, I think, as you say, one of the ideas is being not necessarily overtly confrontational. Um, I think it's important to have humor, um, to recognize um, the, the privilege that we have in some situations and and as you said pro approach things in a constructive way um it, you know maybe not a, a sort of complaining way and yet mentioning it and being clear that there are things that we need to work on um i i, I think you know there's that balance we shouldn't be apologetic about it you know we shouldn't be saying oh uh, it sounds i don't mean to complain but that's not helpful and i think we need to be firm but we can be firm and 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 positive and non-confrontational, which I think is beneficial. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've heard you often say, which is absolutely true, is, you know, this, everybody benefits from this. And, and, and um, this isn't a zero sum game that I, you know, and, and so often we're, you know, speaking to the choir with all of this for the people who are maybe more skeptical or think this isn't really worthwhile objective. Uh, and then as you yourself have so often said, 
um, that we can say, well, actually, in societies that are more gender equal, people of all genders live longer, people are happier, people are more peaceful, people are more economically prosperous. I mean, there's nothing that gets worse with more gender equality. So, it, you know, nobody should be saying, I, I don't really care. I don't need to live any longer. It's no, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but we also have to be vigilant because this idea that, well, it's obviously a good thing. And we know that, and we've said that once, and we had our employees at a, at a, at a diversity conference once, so it should just happen now. We know that that's also not the case. We know that it's very easy um, for things to slide back. We've seen that in the in the global pandemic, how many years we've gone back in the crisis. We see what is happening in, in situations of conflict, as we have seen you know, in Afghanistan this past year, as we are seeing in Ukraine now. And, and we, we have to be vigilant. It's not gonna happen by itself. And we just need to you know, drink more coffee and put more energy into this and, and, and keep going um, because it, it's gonna be to benefit of everybody, um, but it's not gonna happen on, by itself. Thanks, Eliza. And uh, on those super positive notes, I would like to thank you for the conversation. It's been an honor and pleasure as always. And we'll give it over now to our great hosts from the United Nations Association of New York. Over to you. Thank you very much to, to both of you for this really interesting and very inspiring conversation. So I th think that we have a few questions and I'd like to introduce Carlo Ladd, who's our communications associate here at UNA, who will who has gone through some of the questions and will ask them from you. Carlo, okay. go ahead. Thank you so much, as Anne said, to uh, both of you. It's really been a fascinating, uh, fascinating presentation to listen to. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, I will, for just to, for time, I will try to condense them, but there are some very lovely compliments uh, to you, uh, First Lady, so uh, you should take a look if you can. Um, the first question here is, could you offer some tangible ways for us, for us who are working to raise the visibility of older women? Older women face cumulative years of gender discrimination exacerbated in old age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. And it's a very interesting point because, as you know, women tend to live longer than men. Um, it's also a gender equality issue that we have much lower pensions than men because we've been working, you know, at lower paid jobs. Um, we're not contributing to them when we take time off to have children, et cetera, et cetera. So, you, you know, in some senses, the lifestyle indicators can go down. And yet the older generation of women have obviously been been. It, it, putting sort of blood, sweat and tears in, into this fight for, for many years and, and have so much experience. And it was actually earlier today in, in Thorshub in this town, we were visiting an old age home because I've been asked a lot, especially in the US about how the situation of older people overall and not just women compares. And, and I just don't have any um, personal experience with it in the US. But, um, you know, in Iceland, at least, I feel like, um, you know, the, the situation in terms of care for the elderly is, is all right. But again, I think it has to do with, with listening to each other's voices. Um, but it's also, an, you know, there's an interesting dynamic in terms of this, the stereotypes as old cultures that we have, maybe I'm going off on a whole tangent here, excuse me, um, that we have for women, because um, I'm also, this is not my own original idea. Uh, this is an author I was speaking with a couple of weeks ago who mentioned this, but I agree with it, that in society, um, we see women so often in the younger ages as these other, you know, these, these vessels for having children or these sexual beings or, 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 or um, accessories to their husbands or all of these other things. And then they are, they're kind of given a little bit of respect in old age because they're sort of, you know, the, the sort of But that's almost really because we have thought that we've written them off in some senses. And so, again, I think with everything else, we just need to work to um, be elevating these people's voices again. They have there are so many role models. And my goodness, the stories that people tell, you know, older women, my um, my grandmother died um, when she was almost 102 and she was a, a nursing sister in the Second World War. Um, and she was fought with the Canadians um, on the at the front in in the operating theater, and she slept 
next to a live mine. And she used to do a lot of speeches um, in her 80s and 90s, um, uh, you know, about uh, Remembrance Day and, and about, you know, why war is bad and, and, and all of this. And, and, you know, she was a really, really tough woman. And, and I think that, you know, those are stories that we need to be telling. Thanks very much for that. And uh, just have a comment here from one of our board members uh, saying that it would be fitting to remember Madeleine Albright, uh, a trailblazer who, we, who was actually a keynote speaker at a uh, United Nations Association of New York gala in the past. And she famously said there is a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Um, so uh, <laughs> it speaks to, to uh, what you were saying there. Um, we have another question here, um, uh, actually relates to uh, the comment that I just read out. Uh, okay. It says, I'm curious, while researching and interviewing people for your book, did you find that at times the biggest challenge to gender equality, especially for women, is a tendency to compete against each other more so than elevating each other? Mm -hmm. Despite movements of women empowerment, I see more of men supporting elevating each other and the idea mm -hmm. of fr fraternity than women mm -hmm. helping each other out. What are your what are your thoughts on that? I, I think that's a that's an excellent point. Um, I wouldn't no, I don't think that it's the biggest challenge, but it is something that we hear talking about a lot. And so I think rather maybe that was that sort of optimist spin. I chose not to focus on stories of situations where that has happened. We know that that does happen, but instead to talk about the benefits of what can happen when we work to elevate each other. So I, I profile a, you know groups of women. Uh, you know, the, a group of sea swimmers who who practiced to swim across the English Channel for money, uh, to raise money for charity. And they were, you know, again, talking about just that importance of building that, that sort of female friendship and network with each other um, to support each other through thick and thin. And, um, and also of the importance say, of professional networks for women, of, of the importance of these areas where women can go golfing together and, and, and really take up space for each other in, in the way that, that men often do. But I kind of, again, the optimist in me kind of thinks that this idea of, of competition between women is, a, is an instrument of the patriarchy to, to uh, make women suspect each other that they are trying to uh, you know, to double cross each other in some way. Whereas I think in fact, I hope so at least that most women really are there to, to elevate each other and encourage each other. And, and if not, maybe that's, um, that's either a, you know, a representation of insecurity that exists because women have been silenced for so long. So it, it's something maybe to be, um, cognizant of, but I think that it's, you know, we just have to talk more of the focus of, of saying that it is okay to spend time to nurture our friendships and it is okay to spend time to develop those personal and professional networks to, to support each other. Thank you. Um, another question here. You mentioned that Iceland's size makes gender equality some, somewhat simpler or easier to measure. Can you expand on that? And is it easy? Can you compare Iceland to like smaller units within other countries, for example, mm -hmm. cities? Mm -hmm. So you're right. I mean, Iceland is very small. Uh, some of the advantages of having it small, as you say, are that um, you can have your voice heard more. You know, you you as an individual proportionately play a bigger role in society, and it's easier to judge things. But conversely, on the global stage, maybe it's harder to be heard. You know, um, and and if you look at say say a country like the United States, the most powerful country in the world, um, if if the most powerful country in the world, which has and the best educational institutions, investment agencies, organizations, you know, if 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 you can get people behind that idea, nothing can stop you. So um, I, I think that large countries obviously have an advantage um, as well and a diversity of voices that is very important. Although I always argue that Iceland is more diverse than, than people often, often think that it is. Um, but having it, this diversity of voices is very important. And then again, it's just, you know, I'm not an expert on other uh, regions or countries. So it, it's very hard for me to sort of translate that and say, you know, people need to do this and that and the other thing. But again, I would hope as well that the results speak for themselves so that, that people um, say that this is not you know, state overreach into individual choices. This is actually something um, that helps to benefit everybody in society. And I would hope that most of us 
would agree that we want to better our societies. Thank you very much for that um, insightful answer. Uh, another question here. I've read that Iceland is not a very religious nation, or at least that the church does not have a lot of power in society. Do you think this is part of Iceland's gender equality secret, or do you think there's a way for religion and gender equality to coexist? So that's a really interesting question. And I haven't actually been asked it much because, and I see this a lot with my immigrants' eyes. So in Iceland, um, there is no separation legally between church and state. In fact, there is an official state church of Iceland, the Lutheran church. Um, they, there is a bishop of Iceland. P people's taxes by default, some of them, go towards the, the state church. Um, so different churches have, have an amount of money. So on, you know, the, the holidays are religious. The, on Good Friday, the flags around the country fly at half mast. Um, I remember asking my husband once driving into town on a Good Friday and saying, "Some there's been some big global crisis, you know, all the flags are half mast. And my husband looked at me and said, it's for Jesus. And as if I was some fool, why didn't I know that? Um, and so, you know, as an immigrant, I found in some senses much closer ties to a religion because most people are baptized, most people are confirmed. But as you say, on the other hand, in 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 most ways, in many ways, it's an extremely secular society. Um, there's decreasing numbers of people who are members of the national church, and there isn't any stigma surrounding issues like single parenthood or or having children before you are married so but i would not say that that has to do with it not being a religious society i would maybe say um you know if anything for, for the people who are religious that the religion has accommodated the social mores of the society so um you know you can go and anybody can get married in the church and 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 you know same sex couples who've had two children together can then get married there's no there's no stigma surrounding that i i mention a um an example uh, of a big billboard for Sunday school that was advertised on the buses last year that featured a a, um, a trans Jesus, um, which you know admittedly awoke public discourse, but you know the the society didn't go nuts about it. So so um, I think that in Iceland it's kind of an example of 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 uh, organized or structured religion also being flexible to to a modern society. I don't know if Hannah wants to. Hannah might have um, a a comment on that too. Do you think? Yeah, feel feel free to jump in. Oh, thank you so much. I was actually admiring how well you described this, and I think you do it way better than I would. I think what is sort of part of the uh, magic around gender equality in Iceland and why it is working is exactly as Eliza is saying that it has reached all of these usual boundaries not only within the church, but also let us remember that within the parliament of Iceland, where we of course have a wide range of perspectives from left to right, there is an almost total consensus around the progressive matters of gender equality. When we have progressive legislation around all kinds of gender equality issue, whether it's around violence of women, whether it's around uh, sort of issues around the jurisdiction of it, whether it's around paternal leave, whether it's around working issues, most of the members of parliament raise hand and you would in no shape or form be able to say where they sit within the political, political spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it is a consensus issue and, and Elisa has the sort of visitors' eyes would see this better than myself, but it's a uniting factor. So we do not maybe, answering the question, experience what others would say is a dividing factor when it comes to gender equality. And just one addition to that, it goes exactly to what Eliza said in the end. There is, because people say, why is everybody agreeing on it? Because we don't see it as a zero-sum game. We firmly believe that everybody can find a positive fact in it. If they don't, don't believe in it as a human right that needs to be done, if they don't believe in it, then they can hang their hat on the economic prospect of it, or mm -hmm. them living longer or being happier or healthier, because all of the indicators would show that. Thanks. Thank you very much um, for uh, contributing to that answer. 
Um, an, uh, another question here, which, you know, it's uh, sort of related. What are your thoughts on the delicate progress that is being made on gender equality in the, is in the Islamic world? Um, if, 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 uh, first that you're going to ask me about Ukraine, because I've been asked about Ukraine a lot in the last um, couple of weeks, obviously. I mean, you know, the well, the Islamic world is such a, a broad, uh, a broad term. And, and so I think it, it's also dangerous to paint um, to paint all of these countries with the same brush because um, you know there's a huge uh, difference in terms of gender equality with what was happening you know in in Afghanistan um, versus in um, Oman for example so so I think um, uh, you know we have to we have to be careful with that and again you know these indicators um, uh, show that you know that the societies are are more prosperous. The more gender equal they are, the more that they allow people to use their voices, and that includes women. And, and you know, talking about Sprakash, uh, I met uh, when I was in London a couple of weeks ago. I met several um, Afghan judges, female judges, who have had to escape after the Taliban took over again, and I just you know talk about uh, bravery and, 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 and courage and the importance of so, so many women in countries who are really risking a lot um, to show that we need to hear women's voices and have women's participation in society. And I have tremendous admiration for all of them. Thank you. And we have time for one final question. Um, who are some of your biggest inspira woman inspirations in politics around the world? Hmm, good question. I, you know, anybody, any woman who runs for office, my hat's off to them because I, I think it's it's incredibly admirable. And and even when I was a kid, when I was um, there was a, a a national election in Canada when I was in eight years old in the third grade, and it wasn't a very exciting election. People knew the results, and and somebody came to campaign at my door. And I just thought I'd met a rock star. I mean, I thought it was the coolest thing that I'd ever seen. Um, so all of them, um, I have a special interest in first ladies, I suppose, and in the ways in which they use their role. Um, I, I was especially pleased, of course, to um, that Hillary Rodham Clinton um, wrote a, a testimonial for my book, which, which was thrilling. I loved reading um, Michelle Obama's memoir. I had the great privilege of meeting uh, Dr. Jill Biden last week. Um, you know, all of them role models in Iceland. Um, you know, obviously we have a female prime minister right now, Katrin Jakobsdottir. Uh, she is she is also a mother of three boys. She is the same age as I am, um, and and I I kind of love the visual of of the photo when there's the three of them who run the three parties that are in the coalition of this sort of five foot two woman in charge with these two older and um, much taller men next to them. And she's the one who has to has to make all the statements. Um, and, and of course, Vigdi is the first president um, who I didn't know was president when I was growing up in Canada. Um, but you can see now, and 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 I, I, out of all of the, you know, hundreds of people that I've met in Iceland, men and women, um, she it, being head of state in that era, it was incredibly, incredibly important. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, First Lady Eliza Reed and, and Hannah Christian Doter um, for this really wonderful conversation. Um, I just wanted to see if Ambassador Valtisson has any closing remarks for us. Not really, only just to thank you. I, I mean, I, I like I said earlier, I really enjoyed reading the, uh, reading, reading your book, Eliza, and, and enjoyed it the conversation and thank you uh, Ms. Nicole for bringing us together. For me I always take inspirations from 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 uh, from conversations like this to do better to keep pushing and uh, that is certainly something that I will do. I really recommend the book. It's really good. Thank you. Okay. So people who want to buy the book um, I'm it's available on Amazon. Um, but I, for your I, local bookstore Oh, you live, yes, absolutely. You have to go to your local bookstore uh, near you. And um, if you would like to become a member of the United Nations Association of New York, we would love to have your membership. You can join us on our website, unanyc.org. And uh, our next, uh, here's a copy of the book again. And we have an event coming up next week. Does economic warfare work? Um, so that is next week, uh, Wednesday, April 7th. 
Um, and again, uh, I would like to thank first Lady Eliza Reed for being with us this afternoon, and also to thank Hannah Berna Christian Doter and Ambassador Valtison, the permanent representative uh, of Iceland to the United Nations. And we really enjoyed uh, hosting you and to have this uh, conversation and we will preserve it on our website on, the, on a video. So thank you very much uh, for everyone for coming out today. Okay. Thank have you so time. much. Great to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much.